Hello and welcome to another video in our short series celebrating elements in crystals from Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre and the British Crystallographic Association. Today we're heading back to where it all started and investigating the crystal structures of the elements Mendeleev predicted. First, let's travel back to before Mendeleev published his thinking. Chemistry at the time was very different to today. It was more of a patchwork of different observations and discoveries, making it hard to notice patterns and therefore hard to make any predictions. Mendeleev was a chemistry teacher and lecturer, with training in teaching and as an academic chemist. This gave him both the motivation to do something about the state of chemistry and also the academic background and skills required. Mendeleev wasn't the first to order the elements by increasing atomic weight, but he arrived at this order by writing the elements' properties on cards, which he rearranged so that they regularly occurred. If an element appeared to be in the wrong place, he preserved his periodic property law above everything else, swapping iodine and tellurium to keep the halogens in one column, and tellurium with its group 6 elements oxygen, sulphur and selenium. He assumed that one of their atomic masses must be wrong, but in actual fact, iodine does have a lower atomic mass than tellurium. That's the number of protons and neutrons, but its atomic number is higher. Unfortunately for Mendeleev, protons hadn't been discovered back then. What really made this arrangement special was that Mendeleev left gaps for undiscovered elements. He even predicted the properties of some of these elements, which, when they were discovered, matched his predictions incredibly closely and showed his predictions to be incredibly accurate. It's these elements we're going to be focusing on today. Eka aluminium, eka manganese, eka silicon and eka boron. The word eka means underneath and that's how these elements got their names. Today eka aluminium is called gallium and we mostly come across the element as gallium arsenide or gallium nitride in semiconductors. These are especially important in smartphones and solar panels as they can be used to convert between light and electrical energy. As well as being useful in the actual conversion material, gallium 3 acetyl acetonate, shown here, is also important for stabilising the material within solar cells, providing a shell which helps prevent water and other contaminants from the air from reducing the quality of the solar cell over its lifetime. The element under manganese is now known as technetium, and although its radioactivity makes its structures hard to investigate, it's very useful as a medical tool, where a small amount is put into the body and decays, letting doctors image different organs selectively. It's an almost ideal medical tool, giving off clear, easily observed signals for a short time. Because of its radioactivity, it's been a huge challenge for chemists and crystallographers to investigate the structures technetium forms. Things we might think of as common, such as its triple bond with nitrogen, were only observed for the first time in 1981. Germanium is an important semiconductor material and is commonly combined with arsenic or gallium for electronic components. Interestingly, organic germanium compounds have relatively low toxicity to mammals, but can be lethal to certain bacteria, giving these compounds potential medical importance, although they aren't in use yet. Another future application for germanium is likely to be nanotechnology, as it can be contained within silicon clusters, which are then placed in position and the germanium freed. Finally, scandium is a bit confusingly named as underboron, despite its position in the periodic table, as Mendeleev didn't have an organisational system for the elements around the transition metal block like we do today. Scandium and boron would actually belong in the same group though, and scandium isn't really a transition metal in the full sense of the definition, as it's unable to support a range of oxidation states. It's also considered to be a part of the rare earth metals, along with yttrium and the lanthanides, because it's present in the same ores in which the other 16 occur. It has similar physical, mineralogical and chemical properties. The name rare earth is a bit misleading. They're not actually rare, but their extraction from the ores they're found in is difficult. In most cases, scandium has a coordination number of three, like boron, which means it's surrounded by three things. However, in some structures, it can be surrounded by five things instead, as the species surrounding the scandium are able to donate their electrons instead of needing any from the scandium itself. Of course, there are lots of ways to arrange the elements that demonstrate different features compared to the one which we tend to see in our chemistry classrooms, 
For example, the lanthanides and actinides tend to get shoved to the bottom, which doesn't really capture their actual position. What do you think Mendeleev would do if he was redesigning his table with all the elements we know about today? That brings us to the end of today's video. Thanks for helping celebrate elements in crystals, and I hope this brought some life to the table which has been so influential in chemistry. For more videos unpacking the elements and where we find them, follow CCDC Cambridge on YouTube, or check out their periodic table pages for more resources and ideas. You can also keep up to date by following the BCA or CCDC on Twitter. Have a look in the description for details. Many thanks to the Royal Society of Chemistry for their generous funding to complete this project. And most importantly to you for wanting to know more today than you did yesterday. See you next time.